गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग तो अंगुना यू हैव गॉट ऑल माय क्वेश्चंस राइट यस 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 सो वी विल स्टार्ट विदाउट फर्दर ado all right so you're good to go good evening everyone my name is angana bose and i am a researcher and a project assistant at tmys i welcome you to the stories of tribal identity and culture that will explore the role of tribal art and tribal representation in art in shaping cultural identity and ideology curated under tmys review june 2023 in collaboration with the center for asia pacific initiatives university of victoria we are also calling for submission of essays poems and short stories under the project to know more about the submission guidelines and the project architecture please visit www.tellmeyourstory.biz this evening i consider myself very privileged to be in the company of our esteemed panelists mr deepak bara dr abhin chakraborty and dr moshir bhattacharya who will shortly share their views and insights with us the topic for today's discussion is artistic descent dismantling power dynamics by the adivasi under the sub theme tribal identity and culture <clears throat> so before we dive straight in and begin i'd like to introduce our speakers without further ado our first speaker for the session is mr deepak bara deepak bara has been a documentary filmmaker since 2002 focusing on issues concerning indigenous communities and marginalized populations in jharkhand and india armed with a fine arts degree and a film and video editing diploma he contributed to more than 52 documentary films he has served in diverse roles including film editing at akra communications and as a coordinator for video volunteers india recipient of many prestigious awards his passion lies in leveraging visual media for advocacy contributing to transformative change and amplifying community voices we are delighted to have you on the panel sir thank you for joining us this evening thank you thank you angna uh, the first and the foremost Next. thing i would like to i mean uh, thank all of you your team uh, for for like organizing this wonderful discussion and uh, it of course uh, do does comes uh, with my line of work yeah so uh adivasi discourse uh, i mean uh, all over india it's a, uh, it's anywhere in the world in fact it's a, it can be called as a subaltern discourse uh, where things are underlying a different narrative same it is like rising in india we often think that india is a, a land of diversity so when it comes to diversity so uh, there are indo aryan people there are dravidian people uh, there are people from mongoloid origins in north east also as well as in central india the main land uh, we are a different set of people uh, 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 we are austric people and our origins uh, can be traced and uh, it has been written all over academic papers like uh, the austric people came from the Uh, Mekong River civilization way back at 5000 BC. So we have a different story to tell, which has been advanced in Indian means. So when it comes to tribal issues, the tribal issues came into national focus around 1920, and coming Dari and Ekke Dari around. in the collections were distributed by the uh, people from elsewhere in the country and they came to we in the tribal areas it is in fact in indigenous areas we have a different set of values different community based administrative systems uh, you will see like in british documents they refer to uh, british rule uh, Areas they call it provinces. Then there are uh, rajas who rule uh, over different parts of India. These areas are called princely states. But when it comes to indigenous people areas, they call it Antal country, Munda country. That is all over the documents. So, yeah, of course they they before that uh, nobody tried to rule over indigenous areas across the country in India. So, so. in fact after 1750s there 
came a different concept of uh, you know the different set of values as well as different set of interacting with various parts of communities by the rulers so zamindars came in so we have separate set of values separate concepts about uh, property rights no individual property rights were there but when revenue system came differences within the adivasi community came into being the gender gap and everything because we didn't have any concept of uh, private property or land so it was all managed under a different set of governance systems in our communities so immediately after 1750s uh, we saw uh, our ancestors uh, they revolted against british empire you will see uh, starting from uh, the, the uh, you know uh, the pahariya revolt and then in 1850s it came uh, like santal who the biggest coordinated uh, which also uh, karl marx acknowledged like it was the people's uh, movement uh, and after 17 uh, after 1855 we learned that violence fighting uh, with this uh, set of governance system with violence was uh, not fruitful enough so after 1700 1850s uh, sardari larai uh, which is also a different set of movement in which uh, uh, many of our community leaders they, they took law law uh, they, they they came to respect law they started learning law and that's how education systems and missionaries they also came in these tribal areas so uh, sardari larai was peaceful but yeah they 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 uh, collected uh, some some money from uh, uh, you know community and they went after advocates who were there in calcutta uh, for the british courts and all so uh, but there was something brewing and then uh, around uh, 1895 birsa munda rose up uh, as a as a big leader at that time and then after uh, we ha- we had uh, in 1980s is 1900s is life ended and and uh, then again came uh, jaypal singh munda who is one of the uh, members of the uh, constituent there is a se- separate Uh, set of story which <laughs> you know uh, he, he was such a great man uh, he, he was a uh, one of uh, the people who who uh, made constitution for this country and he is so neglected neglected and uh, you know the uh, government of india never cared about publishing a note or a government paper on advertisement even a poster for him so adivasi communities uh, when it comes to this subject artistic dis- descent this is the era this is how uh, adivasi community can uh, move ahead uh, they can they can uh, uh, fight uh, uh, things like identity they can they can address issues around their socio political uh, structures uh, also the major thing displacement and uh, basically it's it's not yet over for adivasi community we are yet to uh, have our story st- i mean stories heard across this uh, global scenario when it comes to this digital age yeah so i think this would be my uh, opening remarks for this discussion and i i thank you dr mausumi and uh, dr abin for joining me it would be a pleasure thank you angana thank you sir for paving the way to the forum of discussion and now we'll introduce the other speakers other panelists and we'll call for their insights respectively so dr abhin chakravarti is an assistant professor in english in chandnagar college he is the editor of the international online journal post colonial interventions and also the author of the monograph popular culture orient black swan 2019 his articles have been published in several national and international journals and anthologies it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the panel sir thank you for joining us this evening and our third speaker for the session is dr moshmi patajaj dr moshmi patajaj holds the position of associate professor and head of the center for journalism and mass communication at vishu bharati a central university of national importance located in shantiniketan india with more than two decades of experience in university teaching and research in india she is a distinguished scholar in her field 
Dr. Bhattacharya was honored with two prestigious postdoctoral research fellowships, one from the Indian Council of Social Science Research, that is ICSSR, Government of India, and another from the International Association of Women in Radio and Television, IEWRT, Focus Norway. Her notable achievements include the successful completion of the internationally acclaimed collaborative project supported by the Department of State, the USA, the Room Where It Happens, which focuses on digital literacy. In 2016, she was awarded a prestigious scholarship by the US government. Study of the US Institute Scholars, that is SUSI Scholars in Journalism and Media Program. Dr. Pottacharjo's expertise spans various fields, including new media, gender studies, convergent journalism, public relations, media education, and mobile communication. Her international recognition extends to representing India in the Scientific Committee of the Symposium of Asia-USA Partnership Opportunities held in Atlanta, USA in April 2013. She has made significant contributions to academia through her work as an editor of books and author of numerous research papers. Additionally, she has served as a paper coordinator for the Gender, Media and Society E-Modules under the Media and Communication Studies of the EPG Bhatshala Program. Dr. Bhattacharya's commitment to promoting women in media is reflected in a service on the India Board of the International Association for Women in Radio and Television from 2015 to 20. She also served as the guest editor of the summer 2014 edition of the Global Media Journal, Indian Edition. Beyond her academic achievement, she is a pioneering member of the Young Leader Think Tank, YLTT, of Friedrich Ebert Stefan, Germany, India chapter, and played a vital role in formulating the youth agenda of India through YLTT. Her dedication to international collaboration led her um, nomination from India for an international learning project for shaping globalization held in Bonn, Germany in 2010. We are honored to have you on the panel, ma'am. Thank you for joining us this evening. Now, let's move to the heart of the discussion and open the forum for discussion further. I would request, now since Dr, uh, I mean, since the first panelist, Mr. Deepak Bara has already shared his insights, I would like to pass the wait to Dr. Avin Chakraborty to share his insights. Sir, the digital floor is all yours. Thank you, Anguna. <clears throat> as far as artistic descent by the Adivasis is concerned, this is something which has been a part of India's cultural landscape for a very long period of time. As Mr. Deepak Bara has already explained, the subalternization of Adivasis is something that began during the colonial era and was continued in many ways by the post-colonial Indian nation state as well, because the modes of governance were not that different from those that were used by the British. And there are a number of different ways in which the post-colonial nation state continued to marginalize the Adivasis, whether it is encroachment of forests or different kinds of mining and other industrial projects, the establishment of dams, all of these led to constant erosion of the areas of habitat that the Adivasis would call their own. And those were lands where they had lived for generations and the memories of their ancestors are also tied with those particular landscapes. And this is not something that the developmental projects ever considered, which is why they were ruthlessly evicted at times with compensation, at times without compensation. They were subjected to various forms of violence and impoverishment, and they continued to remain under various forms of quasi-feudal agrarian exploitation at the hands of landlords and moneylenders even years after all those systems were legally abolished by the Indian government. As a result, for, con for several decades, even after independence, the Adivasis obviously continued to suffer from various forms of subjugation. And in my own line of work, this is something that I have often attempted to examine, whether it is by reading the narratives of Hajda Shovendra Shikhar or the poems of Meena Kandasamy 
or uh, the poems of Jacinta, Kirketa, uh, and uh, various such other individuals. And all of the, and if one looks at these texts, one finds certain recurrent themes. For example, the loss of one's own language and culture. Again, uh, if you look at the way in which colonial governments have worked all across the world, there again you will see that it is the European master's language which has often been imposed on the tribes at the expense of their own languages, particularly because those languages did not have written scripts of their own. Something similar also happened in case of Adivasis in India, where their own languages, the kind of myths and literatures and histories that they had, which were often transmitted orally from one generation to the next, they were often decimated because of the official imposition of various kinds of other mainstream vernaculars. And even when in certain cases those vernaculars were recognized, the learning opportunities were few and far between. And the areas inhabited by the Adivasis continued to remain underdeveloped and without those basic facilities of urban civilization that we often take for granted. So when you look at, for example, a text by uh, Hashda Shovindra Shekhar, Adventures in uh, Champak Bagh, which focuses, it is a children's narrative. It focuses on this fantastic dragon-like creature whom the children name Jwala Kumar because it is able to breathe fire. But what strikes me as a reader while reading that particular narrative is the fact that the family of Mohan Chander, around whom the novel, uh, the text revolves, that family does not have access to food. Uh, that family does not have access to medicine. They are often without electricity. Mohan Chander himself is a daily wage earner and obviously his condition is financially uh, extremely distressing. And the schools that are there are also located uh, quite far away, which often makes it difficult for the children to travel to the schools, which again is essential for them, not just for learning, but also because of the free midday meal that they would get, which is again a very significant source of nutrition and survival for them. So all these basic things that we generally take for granted, water, electricity, education, and so on, and medical care, and so on and so forth, these remain unavailable to a large portion of the Adivasis even today. One of the things which is often overlooked while discussing the representation of Adivasis, uh, particularly the infiltration of Maoist organizations in areas dominated by Adivasi uh, villages and communities, is that much of this uh, uh, participation stems from years of neglect and subjugation which the Adivasi communities have had to endure. And again, this is not new. This was also the case during the late 1960s and early 1970s when the Naxalite movement had begun. Hundreds of Adivasis participated in those movements precisely to challenge the entrenched patterns of subjugation that they had to endure for generations. And again, in certain cases, in certain parts of India, those patterns of subjugation continue to exist. And that therefore, it becomes extremely difficult for the Adivasis either to lead lives in accordance with their own customs or practices, or to assert their cultural identities in uh, self-sustaining and enriching ways, or to plan for themselves a kind of equitable future where they can also aspire to those benefits of modernity which are often accessible to many of us. And it is because of these uh, multidimensional uh, problems that Authors who represent the crisis of Adivasi existence in India, in whichever language, they repeatedly go back to these uh, issues of deprivation. 
And what is also remarkable is that in these representations of deprivation, nature obviously plays a very important role because the relationship of the Adivasis with nature is not one which is based on exploitation and appropriation. It is based on mutuality and respect. The kind of mutuality and respect that is often lost in all those a corporatized developmental project where the primary focus is profit at the expense of natural resources. When you look at the poems and the representations in different fictional narratives that Adivasi authors often offer, you see that the rivers, the trees, the forests, the mountains, they are not just seen as sources of this uh, mineral or that natural resource and so on and so forth. They are not just seen as sites for the production of electricity or the excavation of uh, different kinds of minerals or uh, creating a highway or a power, power generating station, etc., etc. They are seen as living entities with a personality, with a history, with a mind of their own with which they consistently interact. Right now, there are uh, large conferences going on regarding the issue of uh, the climate crisis and the ecological problems that the world is facing every day. Adivasis uh, across India, and in fact, across the world, have a very significant relationship with their natural habitat that challenges the greed-driven power and profit driven mode of exploiting natural resources that are generally dominant all over the world and which are again primarily responsible for the ecological crisis that we are facing. But uh, if one is able to look at it from the perspective of these Adivasis, then we would see that there are various other ways in which one can interact with nature in a much more sustainable manner, which would ultimately be beneficial to man in hundreds of different ways. For example, Jacinta Kirketa in one of her poems uh, talks about the fact that the mohua flower is not to be plucked from the trees. One should wait till the morning uh, for the flowers to fall from the trees instead of plucking them from the trees at night. And she sort of compares the branches on which the flowers are blooming with a mother's womb. And just as the baby is supposed to be born from the mother's womb at the uh, right moment, we, which cannot either be delayed or uh, uh, preponed in the same way, uh, the poet says that once the time is right, the flowers will automatically fall from the trees to the ground when they can pick it up. And therefore, there is no need to really pluck them from the trees because the very act of plucking would imply a certain kind of violence, a kind of violent uh, attitude towards nature, which the Adivasis in general always abhor, despise, and they always prefer a relationship that is harmonious, symbiotic. And that is precisely the kind of perspective that we require in today's world as well, if we want to ensure that the world remains habitable for future generations. So this is these are considerations which repeatedly come up in their uh, literary representations as well. And these are things which we need to consider for the betterment of the humanity's own future. And not just for one country or one nation or one particular region, but these are considerations, these are approaches, these are perspectives which are essential for universal humanitarian welfare. Thank you very much for sharing your perspective, sir. They are very pertinent. And I would now request Dr. Moshwari Bhattacharya to share her insights. Ma'am, your turn now. Thank you so much, Amuna. Uh, I mean, to you and your organization, this is a very interesting and important topic for discussion and very tough also. If I 
uh, may say so. And I'm very happy to be here in this platform with uh, Dr. De um, Abhin Chakraborty and Deepak Bada. And of course, Anguna, you are here. One thing I want to mention here without uh, you know, getting into much detail, because they have beautifully explained what the thing is. So being a teacher for the last two decades, I just want to focus on the topic here. So what is that first? I, I want to divide it in two parts. Like the title of today's topic is Artistic Descent, Dismantling Power Dynamics by the Adivasi. I want to uh, mention one personal experience here. Then I will get into this artistic descent and how actually it is related to dismantling power dynamics by the Adivasi. I'll be very brief because I know that we have to discuss it more uh, like in an interactive manner. In Shantiniketan, very near to my place, there is a uh, there is a museum this, which I visited a few years back, which is Bishnubati Santhal Museum. I'm not sure whether my co-panelists, they are aware of it. So it's wonderful museum. Uh, this museum has been curated by Dr. Borobaski. So here, when I went there with my students, my PG students, what I saw was wonderful. Like... In that museum, which is meant for the Santali school students, all their rituals and their festivals, everything, models of their festivals and rituals, which the Adivasi, they are not following now, but they have kept it there very beautifully and with the models. So immediately, and they have given the description also short the way uh, one I go for, like the, the way the marriages happen, the way they actually go for their, uh, if one passes away, if any death happens in a family. So how do they mourn? How do they hunt? And hunting in the sense for every sense, it's, it's maybe a rat, it's maybe a pig. That actually that depicts, that depicted the entire it's it's an exhibition of the culture itself and the way and the very artistic way they have maintained it and most importantly the way they have used the light there natural light so that it does not hamper the natural sense of the museum and i uh, trust you and me from that point of time i tried to uh, you know, dig out this thing. How do things go with this entire culture and all and why they have done this? And Dr. Borobaski himself told me that every week we try to bring our Santhal kids here, those who study, and we try, we try to encourage them to understand what their real culture is. That actually, that, that was pretty interesting. Like, even they have got people out there, those who actually, you know, elaborate on the models. So, yes, welcome back, Angun. I think there was a connection issue at your part. So now, while watching that, I try to send most of my students to that museum, though it, it is not open all that time. And that museum actually opened my, my eyes that how things actually happen culturally and the way they are trying to hold on to their culture and to their root. This was it's an amazing thing. So I hope you all will try to visit that once. Now coming to artistic descent. And theoretically and practically, we know that artistic descent refers to a form of expression that challenges or questions societal norms, which both my previous speakers, they have tried to explain wonderfully, and political beliefs or cultural practices through, through cultural means, actually. And it is a way uh, for artists to voice their op op opinions and critic authority or the power structures, often addressing controversial or sensitive topics. And artistic descent can take many forms including painting, including sculpture, performance art, literature, music, film, many more. And it aims to provoke thought, spark discussion, and inspire change by highlighting social injustices. And of course, advocating for marginalized communities or challenging prevailing ideologies, which 
I, I was listening to my previous speakers. They gave specific examples for that. Now, the thing is how we can actually, you know, connect this artistic descent to this nantling power dynamics by the Adivasi. Yes, of course, by that time we have already understood what significant role there is there in the context of dismantling power. Like Adivasis are indigenous communities in India. Both my previous speakers, they have given a lot of exam examples on that who have historically faced marginalization, discriminalization and exploitation. And through artistic expressions such as as I mentioned, music, dance, visual, art, they can challenge oppressive power structure and advocate their rights and autonomy. I have jotted down five points. We may discuss later on that, like it can be resistance and resilience, cultural preservation, protest and activism, empowerment and representation, and most importantly, alternative narratives. Overall, Artistic descent by Adivasis in India serves as a powerful tool for dismantling power dynamics. Of course, like the way we try to promote social justice. And it's very easy to say or maybe very easy to discuss in such a panel. But I hope that your organization, they are what they are trying to do is that through such discussions, which is obviously very important to reach out to many people and those who are yet not thinking about it. To reach out to them also so right now i want to stop here and obviously with uh time i would like to you know incorporate more insights thank you okay. thank you very much for your valuable observations ma'am thank you for joining us this evening uh, moving on we will now transition to the engaging question and answer session now my first question goes out to the first panelist being a filmmaker how does artistic descent play a role in challenging existing power structures and advocating for the rights and representation of Adivasi communities? And how can tribal art forms contribute to the broader social and political movements? This question is for well, Mr. Sipa. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, uh, to answer that, I would uh, first like to uh, tell you a thing about value systems which uh, which adivasi communities especially cherish and what their worldview is like different from the others uh, in indian constitution we have a set of values uh, uh, which we as a community as an indian citizen we strive strive towards and it's well written in preamble to the constitution that is equality uh, that is freedom that is justice and of course there is fraternity also so when it comes to adivasi community so uh, we do not understand culturally like all these set of values are in between human to human no it also <laughs> i mean we also uh, see the nature as a part of it we 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 see equality with nature we see uh, freedom in the nature we see uh, justice in the nature and of course the, the fraternity with the nature and that is the difference between the world view that's how we see properties around so as a filmmaker uh, i have a huge task i i suppose i understand that i have a unique platform to contribute to uh, social and political discourse uh, by including advocacy for the rights and representation of adivasi communities and especially i do documentary films a lot so artistic descent can play a very crucial role for me in challenging uh, existing uh, power structures through uh, various means. Like uh, uh, there is filmmaking, which allows you to disrupt narrative and present alternative perspectives. Uh, of course, uh, by challenging these stereotypes and so questioning the diversity and richness of the Adivasi cultures, uh, well, a filmmaker can contribute to dismantling preconceived notions and biases. Uh, providing authentic and positive representation of Adivasi communities. Through my films, uh, it can empower these communities and it helps in fostering a sense of pride, identity and a sense of belonging among the uh, Adivasi individuals, which, which is slowly breaking away in our community. Uh, as a filmmaker, well, uh, we use this thing, we have been using this thing 
the storytelling for a social change. Uh, using my storytelling skills, uh, I try to shed light on rights, social issues faced by Adivasi communities. Uh, Dr. Abin very well pointed out what are the issues that Adivasi communities uh, are, are engulfed in, in fact. So, uh, so through uh, like uh, storytelling, uh, we can address topics such as land rights, uh, cultural preservation, economic disparities, and uh, of course, to raise awareness and mobilize community, uh, mobilize other people for support and for positive change. So through filmmaking, I also try to collaborate uh, with Adivasi artists uh, uh, so that they can feel included, uh, the musicians, visual artists. Uh, these representations uh, uh, fosters, I mean, more inclusive nature and representative creative process. So that is very, in fact, important for, uh, for my work. Uh, of course, uh, all these efforts, I think uh, a filmmaker from an Adivasi community or any filmmaker uh, who wants to choose Adivasi as a topic for their filmmaking, uh, they have a big power in their hand. And that is the need of an hour and Adivasi communities need that a lot. Thank you, sir, for sharing how filmmaking and storytelling, the art of storytelling to be specific, serves as a very empowering tool for the Adivasi community and to reach out to the vast mass of audience. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to the next panelist. The question goes out to the uh, second panelist, that is Dr. Rabin Chakraborty. From a literary perspective, how do artistic forms of dissent reflect the socio-cultural complexities and power dynamics within Adivasi communities? And what insights can be drawn from these expressions about the struggles for autonomy and self-representation? That uh, struggle for autonomy that you're talking about, that is again, obviously one of the most uh, recurring themes that is uh, found in the literary representations by Adivasi authors. And uh, the problem that the Adivasi communities obviously face is that they are subjected to various forms of pressures from multiple perspectives. On the one hand, there are religious groups which uh, try to seduce them by offering various forms of infrastructural support, amenities, etc., etc., as a result of which the Sarna religion of Adivasis living in the Chotunagpur uh, area uh, has become more or less extinct, and many of the Adivasis have uh, converted either to various forms of dominant Hindu rituals or to various forms of Christianity and so on and so forth. And therefore, cultural authenticity is often lost and rediscovering that cultural authenticity is often part of that artistic descent that we are talking about. At the same time, descent is also directed at various forms of uh, systemic injustices associated not just with various forms of corporate development, but also the uh, red tape associated with bureaucracy, the apathy associated with the administration, the kind of exploitation that is meted out to them often by uh, the armed forces that are uh, posted in different areas inhabited by the Adivasi uh, communities. So all of these pressures are there. And in the literature of the Adivasi authors, we see recurrent reflection of their discontent against such manipulation, against such violence, and uh, the kind of losses that they have to suffer on that account. One of the uh, very significant contributions in this context is obviously by Hanshda Shobhendra Shekhar, whose uh, anthology of short stories, The Adivasi Will Not Dance, is a highly acclaimed one. And again, in that uh, eponymous uh, story, The Adivasi Will Not Dance, we see that there is this award-winning Adivasi artist, Mangal Murmu, 
who, however, refuses to participate in a governmentally organized cultural program because he understands how the Adivasis are being used as tokens, how Adivasi performances are not valued in themselves, but only as a kind of exotic tool with which some kind of brownie points may be gained either by the local administrative officers or by different ministries catering to international audiences and so on and so forth. And he refuses to remain a puppet in this scheme, which is why he says that the Adivasi will not dance. And this refusal is again part of not just his descent, but also his attempted dismantling of the power dynamics as a result of which even 75 years after independence, various Adivasi communities continue to languish in poverty, in various forms of malnutrition, in various uh, kinds of social maladies as well. And these are things which uh, the authors keep highlighting. However, it would be incorrect to assume that the authors paint a kind of utopian representation of Adivasi societies as being entirely good and free from all kinds of problems and so on and so forth. That is obviously not the case. For example, even in Adivasi communities, women are often subjected to various forms of gendered oppression, various forms of gendered violence. Many women among the Adivasi communities can be identified as witches by the local panchayats or uh, a gathering of the village elders and so on. And they may be subjected to various forms of assault on the basis of such identification. There are uh, men who are obviously uh, often extremely chauvinistic to the women of their households and subject them to domestic abuse, various forms of discrimination and so on and so forth. The problem for the Adivasi women becomes at times doubly or even triply uh, complicated because while on the one hand they are subjected to various forms of patriarchal abuse from men within their own communities, they are also subjected to various other forms of discrimination by men outside of their communities. Some men would either exploit their labor and pay them much less than the men for same or perhaps even more amount of work. And then there are other external uh, agents who would often uh, look at the Adivasi women only from the perspective of sexual gratification and so on and so forth. And again, these are issues which have been represented in countless cultural representations, novels, films, etc., made by non-Adivasi individuals. <coughs> Right? And uh, the Adivasi has also often been seen as this uh, very pure uh, kind of uh, an isolated reservoir of goodness, something akin to the colonial uh, motif of the noble savage. But again, when Adivasi authors are themselves writing about uh, these issues, they often end up busting these myths, they often end up challenging these stereotypes and find new ways of self-representation, which takes into account the complications without either romanticization or exoticization. Thank you so much, sir, for beautifully portraying your side and giving a direction uh, from the literary point of view. And thank you for all the examples that you have provided. Actually, uh, shed much light on the conversations to follow. Now we move on to uh, questioning her next, or in fact, inviting her insights on the next question. Just a minute. Yes. Now, based on uh, your advocacy work, how does the promotion of artistic dissent harness itself through new media and serve as a means of reclaiming cultural autonomy 
and challenging just a minute i uh, will again rephrase the question because the question seems to be quite long yes ma'am could you provide insights into the role of mass communication in total in fostering community cohesion among adivasi groups yeah here i would like to uh, you know uh, refer to a very recent and important study which is a research uh, best you know uh, document which uh, has been prepared by uh, avirub bauri and dr rahul amin which is a very important part i think uh, to share with you all here and they have done a study it's very specific study i'm mentioning here then i'll be you know uh, discussing it in generally it's on the uh, exposure of the shopur community of galidi in uh, galidi in charkhand state um, where they have documented about the low level of media exposure of the the adivasis to both print and audio visual media i'm very i'm becoming very specific here and of the total respondents only 2% reported having the habit of reading newspaper and this was found to be a female practice while males kept newspapers at bay very interesting finding men were not television viewers either a trend noted among females also the study also noted low listener levels for radio among the residents from such trends the researchers concluded about media penetration being low among the shobur community which is a largely illiterate marginalized community of adivasis now as i have mentioned the specific study now i want to elaborate it further like such low exposure to education and to media interest and the outside world to media like contributes to the continued segregation of adivasis and other communities which in turn accentuates the need for increasing social cohesion among and within adivasis and the tribal groups here another researcher as per ted cantrell many he implies developing improved understanding about other groups and stimulating the growth of understanding and trust among them there is a tendency of not trusting the mainstream media that is also there that is also a cause of you know their low low interest and cantle leads to dismantling of stereotypes and held misconceived notions about other groups such efforts towards creating social cohesion involve promotion of the outlook through campaigns which are centered on demonstrating to adivasi groups about possible collaboration towards common goal and once this is set in motion the united purposes that emerge bind the groups together and a sense of belongingness infuses bond homing and in this sense social cohesion can be viewed as positive future for diversified societies but when media which is a potent tool of mass communication is rendered powerless challenges arises in this dissemination of information and awareness community radio in such scenarios can be tried as it had emerged from movements to facilitate social cohesion direct involvement of community members in operation of such community radio initiatives can motivate the larger community to adapt to this form also as content can be tailored to suit local interest and communicate about local issues and problems locals will find such inputs to be more relevant to and useful in their everyday lives this can improve listener numbers and bring community radios closer to the masses also radios are economical and therefore some sets can be also be distributed across the villages to reduce proportion of non ownership it can bring about community listening to programs which to will strengthen cohesion among different people and groups and here i would like to mention two 
uh, two you know uh, initiatives one i think uh, all of you are aware about what is cg net swara which is very popular in the you know central uh, india and one is people's archive of rural india this though they both are rural plat i mean digital platform but they are actually trying to dig out the news from different remote parts of the country specifically on different different adivasi so even the people they are even if they are not there is one tendency which we have noticed that the mainstream media actually neglect us but if we actually there are people those who are trying now my question here that many people those who are doing research on this those who are and many activists also maybe they are aware of cg net swara and they are aware about pari or people's archive of rural india but how to go how to reach out to people that you please come out and try and quote and quote mainstream media those who i mean the media we call this media this mainstream because maybe the revenue model but basically they are not reaching out to more people so in that way such alternative models like if this model can reach out and with the help of the others and those who are thinking about it so i hope situation will be better maybe in near future thank you thank you ma'am for uh, very proposing very viable perspectives very doable solutions thank you ma'am again moving back to our first panelist i would like to put this question forward that could you elaborate on the significance of media and social activism acting as voices of dissent and how have these expressions evolved as a tool for advocacy on adivasi issues of cultural resistance and identity assertion okay so well uh, i started my uh, film making career as uh, when i w- when i came back to uh, jharkhand after finishing my studies in pune uh, i found out like there is no film making around here in jharkhand so to fill that gap uh, i started documenting people's movement uh, uh, like there is always people's movement in tribal areas across india either it be for dams power projects mining or even uh, uh, protection of wildlife Uh, so so i mean adivasis are seen like uh, they are separated from forest they are uh, a separate thing they they do not have anything to do with the forest but this perspective has been changing so i started my uh, work uh, uh, around documenting people's movement and making documentary films around it and whatever work before 2010 uh, you'll find it my uh, linkedin profile that all those uh, videos and films Uh, i have done uh, for the tribal uh, issues so after 2010 there there came a change in me like i i i started collaborating with uh, uh, many groups one of the groups uh, 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 ma'am very well mentioned the cg net swara so i was with another group which were doing mobile based uh, phone based mobile phone based journalism across india and uh, uh, we used to wonder uh, before designing the project uh, how would the world be if if uh, the world is seen through the eyes of marginalized communities whether it be adivasis uh, minorities or or dalits or or even women so so we started a campaign we we, we started training uh, various social activists who were assisting community across tribal areas uh, uh, so we we trained them we we built a module and we trained them how to use mobile phones uh, for uh, you know uh, community journalism so what we would they would used to do they would uh, they would do a script and uh, they would uh, identify an issue uh, uh, they they would shoot interviews and uh, all the uh, evidence based uh, footage uh, that would go along with the story and a very beautiful 3 minute informative piece about the issues especially which the community is going through so after producing these these videos 3 minute videos they would straight away go to the uh, the person responsible for the issue basically they used to 
uh, document on various issues like entitlements, uh, arts and cultures, belief systems, genders, displacement, and and a lot, water and what not. I mean, so the disparities uh, which uh, uh, Dr. Abin pointed out, the rapid development which Adivasis are uh, not accustomed with, they they have not dreamed like the the rapid development which uh, has come across. So they are still struggling. So so they used to do this uh, reporting and they would show it to the person responsible, the the uh, government officer responsible and. Out of 100 cases, we would uh, solve at least 30 cases. That would that that is a very good number, in fact. So these types of tools, I mean, like uh, mobile-based, of course, radio, uh, more of like uh, you know, other forms of art, whether it be drama uh, or traditional paintings, uh, uh, and, and and, and so many things, it, it comes under a, a lot of things. That those things can amplify voices of, uh, of uh, I mean, tribal communities. Also, these tools can uh, uh, disseminate information uh, uh, for the sake of cultural, social, and economic cha challenges that, that is being faced by the Adivasi community. And uh, they could uh, inspire uh, public opinion. They could, uh, in fact, uh, catalyze those opinions. and and uh, advocate for policy changes uh, which media and social activism if we, if that goes well hand in hand uh, that 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 can shed uh, light on discriminatory practices or insufficient legal protections or uh, that activists can advocate for policy changes uh, to promote cultural preservation land rights as well as social justice which our constitution streams of yes Thank you, sir, for bringing out uh, this particular perspective of yours. Why? Because somehow or the other, these are very intermingled and this can serve to be very powerful and empowering at the same time. Okay, like we move on, uh, moving on to the next panelist. Now, I would like to ask Dr. Abhin Chakraborty that in your research, what role does heritage preservation through our artistic descent play in fostering a sense of collective identity and resilience among Adivasi communities? And how do these narratives challenge dominant narratives and stereotypes imposed by mainstream society? Right. Uh, as I was saying in uh, my previous uh, answer, the mainstream society often has very limiting and uh, derogatory notions about the Adivasis in many ways. And there are various kinds of nicknames that are often used, right? They are often called junglies and uh, they are called by many such other names which signify a sense of civilizational regression or inferiority or cultural backwardness, etc., etc. But when Adivasis start writing their own narratives, when Adivasis start representing themselves, they obviously end up debunking uh, these myths that are fostered by the mainstream communities. For example, uh, Jacinta Kirketa in one of her poems called Intazar or Waiting says they are waiting for us to become civilized and we are waiting for them to become human. So obviously what we in the mainstream society consider as civilization and which we wish to impose on the Adivasis is very different from the Adivasi's own sense of uh, identity, culture, heritage, civility, humanity, etc. And when we are talking about heritage, uh, we often have this incorrect notion that heritage must necessarily mean some big, old, uh, slightly decayed buildings which one has to protect. But heritage is not just about only those tangible edifices. There are a lot of intangible heritages as well. So, for example, uh, the way in which Adivasis interact with land, the way in which Adivasis interact with natural resources, that is also part of their heritage. And again, I was talking about uh, that uh, short story 
the adivasi will not dance and there through the voice of mangal murmu we can look at different kinds of crises which the adivasi communities have been subjected to because of the kind of civilization that the mainstream society is trying to impose on them uh, one of jacinta karketa's uh, poems focuses on mohua flowers and again the collection and selling of mohua flowers is something that adivasis have been doing for a long period of time but in those areas when there is a mine established for collecting and transportation of coal when a thermal power uh, generating station is built which again requires a lot of coal then what happens is that the coal or of soot and cinder they become dissipated all across the area the trees become black the land becomes black and uh, we hear from the, the narratives mm -hmm. how the paddy that they have uh, that they have been growing how the rice that they eat is no longer white but it has become black because the soil gets mixed with the coal how the trees themselves are turning black how the fruits and flowers are no longer blooming and flourishing as they used to which means that the economic basis of their existence is being challenged and that's what again would also lead to migration and uh, migration again brings with it various other kinds of challenges as well not just to livelihood not just to the family structure but to one's cultural identity as well because if somebody is forced to migrate from one district to another depending on seasonal agriculture and so on and so forth then following the cultural rhythms of one's own community becomes almost impossible and then one's culture instead of becoming a part of one's uh, everyday existence uh, a part of one's organic social life simply turn into certain vendable commodities certain fragments that can be showcased in this uh, festival or that cultural program or that function here and there for the benefit of others and these are issues which repeatedly crop up either in the writings of hajda shobindu shekhar or in the poems of jacinta kirketa or in various other texts that are written by people belonging to adivasi communities in the northeastern part of india these are common issues which have been uh, troubling these adivasi communities everywhere even in places like the andaman and nicobar islands even there despite there being biological uh, reserves despite there being protected areas there are so many plans for rapid industrialization for uh, creating new harbors docks industries etc etc which not just uh, endanger the ecological balance of those islands but also directly hamper the cultural existence of the adivasis that have been living there for centuries right and these are issues which can often lead to various kinds of uh, explosive uh, manifestations of discontent which when they do happen they shock us but what we don't take into account is the kind of systemic victimization that goes on silently beyond our purview for decades and decades eventually culminating in that kind of an explosive manifestation and as far as the adivasis are concerned they are very patient people they don't generally resort to uh, those explosive uh, moments they keep on tolerating for generations and generations the kind of uh, subjugation that is inflicted on them the kind of miseries and tortures they are basically peaceful which is why they keep accepting all of it as somehow part of their lot somehow part of their destiny but obviously it can't go on forever and there are moments when the dam sort of breaks and then uh, we sort of uh, sit up and take notice 
But once that moment is past, we again begin to forget and ignore the kind of problems that have been ailing them. And uh, that leads to simply the continuation, the proliferation of the earlier patterns of victimization. And these are issues which the uh, Adivasi authors in their texts keep highlighting. So yes, there is resilience. Yes, they keep uh, talking about the kind of uh, troubles, the kind of adversities their forefathers had witnessed, and they keep, uh, uh, you know, participating in the processes. They keep tolerating the kind of oppression that is uh, meted out to them. But then again, their uh, heritage, their uh, uh, history is also about resistance. And that resistance is something which is also ingrained in Adivasi existence. And uh, that is why uh, after a point of time, when that threshold of tolerance is crossed, it becomes impossible to further negotiate with them. And they become steadfastly opposed to anybody who is trying to uh, externally manipulate or uh, subjugate them in any way, which is again extremely problematic for the future of a democracy. A democracy can only sustain itself if all the components within that democracy are able to gel towards a possible cohesive future. But the way in which in India for the last various decades, we have been uh, subjecting the Adivasis and various other marginalized communities to different forms of oppression, much of which has not really been remedied. It is extremely difficult to imagine how that kind of cohesion can be sustained in the future. Thank you, sir, for painting a very real, a realistic picture and a very nuanced a perspective towards heritage and heritage preservation. Now, moving on, we'll also be asking Dr. Moshwari Bhattacharya about her particular perspective on. Now, uh, while I was going through the works, I found that uh, I've, I'm all ears and I'm very curious about how can the principles of cultural sensitivity and collaborative storytelling empower Adivasi communities to shape their own narratives and advocate for their rights. Uh, thank you for the question, Anguna. Actually, we already have one filmmaker here, so he has already explained the way they, you know, uh, use storytelling for this and all. I was uh, listening to that, and uh, the way uh, Dr. Abhin Chakraborty was also talking about the literature perspectives and all, especially while he was mentioning about that book, that the Ardivalsi uh, will not dance. Actually, I have uh, gone through that book very recently. So, yeah, and I think there is some kind of series will be made on the basis of that uh, I know book. So I'm not sure. So I'm also eagerly waiting for that. Anyway, coming back to the question, I would like to mention one very interesting a research paper of Lucas Petty, where what you are talking about the collaborative storytelling. So collaborative storytelling as a conversation centric activity, which attempts actually to uh, produce a narrative discourse, wherein narrator or narrators of stories recount tells about past happenings and occurrence, including narratives of protagonists, whose actions have contributed uh, in altering the underlying situation. I think uh, our filmmaker panelist will be able to, you know, understand this the way where I'm actually coming from. And in this sense, collaborative storytelling is about also recounting of the history of communities and how they have struggled against challenges and overcome them participants in such sessions either add to the narrative being orated or guide its course towards authentic recalling of sequences, which I have noticed in many cases. And such storytelling is not a creation of, uh, is not a creation of culture only and therefore is distinct from documented stories. 
And it has thus been um, opined by scholars, many research scholars, that the exercise performs these specific functions. And the first is presenting the narrator as credible and important through subtle manipulation of the listeners. And the second is passing on information related to survival in a very low cost, I mean, very cost effective manner from which the audience can benefit. And the third and the most important is fostering cooperation within the groups and bonding with other groups and societies. And storytelling thus acts as that glue which holds the communities together by creating uh, collective memories and also creation of social history. For Adivasi and other groups whose exposure to mainstream activities and social orders uh, remain remitted, collaborative storytelling is a vital path, though uh, which greater degree of cohesion and cultural sensitivity can be achieved. And also collaborative storytelling can act as a reminder to Adivasis about their rich cultural and traditional backgrounds and their indigenous art forms, which are appreciated by a wide array of viewer beyond their immediate surroundings. As I was mentioning in my initial remark about that Vishnu Bhati Shantal Museum. So I'm trying to document that museum for a greater audience. And I, I think which is very important and obviously trying to collaborate in, with different groups also for that. And it can apprise them of the sacrifices of brave Adivasis against oppressions under different regimes and other difficulties. Such can instill a sense of pride and confidence among people, uh, different groups. And, uh, and such narrations through collaborative storytelling actually offers them the opportunity to narrate and present the same before wider audience thereby enhancing knowledge and understanding of other sections about Adivasis and their ways of life, culture, and tradition. And hence, through storytelling, marginalized and less exposed groups can construct their own narratives and share it with others. It can keep others informed and also address any notions held mistakenly, which is very important. Disinformation and misinformation is a very, these two are very common words. And we have seen several such instances where related to Adivasis and their culture and all, and which is which are related to disinformation and misinformation, which are very, very important to address. And with through collaborative work, obviously this can be addressed properly. And it enhances cultural sensitivity and aids other understand Adivasi and Adivasi cultures better, thereby making both culturally tolerant of each other, which is very important part, I think. And this can also stimulate bonding between general groups and Adivasi groups, which are augurs well for society in general. Thank you, ma'am, for providing ample food for thought. Uh, we'll move on to our first panelist uh, for his insights on this particular topic. Like, for example, what are the major obstacles faced by Adivasi artists in articulating their dissent through, through artistic means? And how can the community driven initiatives, international collaborations amplify their voices to achieve social justice, inclusivity? Uh, no. Uh, Angra, uh, I heard to uh, Dr. Abhin and uh, it's still, the poem is still ringing in my head. There is a poet, I mean, uh, his name is uh, Anura, uh, anu, Anuj Lugun, sorry, Anuj Lugun. He is stationed in uh, Gaya University in Bihar. He wrote a wonderful uh, poem that I used uh, in one of my films. So the poem goes in Hindi and it's uh, like this, ki, uh, हमारे जंगल में लोहे के फूल खिले हैं हमारे जंगल में लोहे के फूल खिले हैं बॉक्साइट के गुलदस्ते सजे हैं हमारे जंगल में लोहे के फूल खिले हैं बॉक्साइट के गुलदस्ते सजे हैं कल एक पहाड़ को ट्रक पे मैंने जाते हुए देखा उससे पहले नदी गई कल एक ट्रक को 
अकल एक पहाड़ को मैंने ट्रक पे जाते हुए देखा उससे पहले नदी गई और अब खबर फैल रही है कि मेरा गांव भी यहां से जाने वाला है सो दैट्स दैट्स हाउ आदिवासी आदिवासी आर एक्सपीरियंसिस एक्सपीरियंसिंग द रेजिस्टेंस आई मीन दैट्स 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 द वर्ल्ड व्यू ऑफ आदिवासी एंड व्हाट इज हैपनिंग इन द डेली लाइफ सो आदिवासी आर्टिस्ट्स आर आल्सो फेसिंग द सेम इश्यूज व्हिच देयर कम्युनिटी इज फेसिंग मेजरली एज मैम टोल्ड अस लाइक uh there is marginalization and stereotyping uh, like adivasi artists often encounter marginalization and stereotyping in mainstream media you will hardly find anybody tribal or adivasi in mainstream media so stereotypes uh, perpetuated by the external forces can undermine the richness and diversity of the adivasi cultures which uh, other panelists have rightly i mean pointed out so adivasi artists they have limited acts, uh, access to res- uh, resources i mean so lack of access of education also resources also platforms uh, to to promote uh, the adivasi artistic talents or uh, i mean mainstreaming them into institution and so that uh, it it can uh, cannot hinder to the growth of adivasi artist as well so of course adivasi artists Uh, uh, they are stationed somewhere in their communities that community is facing land displacement and also cultural ero- erosion uh, our panelist pointed out there is language language is not uh, a simple uh, uh, i think any like any other tool language is something which carries ancestral knowledge and knowledge systems of the community and uh, slowly as we uh, as we are Uh, mainstreaming all the communities into a, 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 a single binary i mean uh, uh, adivasis are losing their uh, language their culture and everything their understanding towards the nature they they are also forgetting their bonding uh, with the nature also so uh, there is loss of their ancestral land which inspires them uh, and artists are uh, like uh, they are being deprived of their connection to their own roots and traditions there are language barriers adivasi uh, communities are smaller in number so it's it's like a, a thing of marketability if you are going to publish in santali language a, a, a book in santali language it, it doesn't have any financial plan to it and it's going to fail any any publisher would struggle to uh, do so to so i mean there are language barriers we have to uh, bridge those gaps and there are economic challenges most of the adivasi artists uh, they are very poor i have seen adivasi artists dying of simple diseases because they didn't have any money or any uh, any uh, you know not a structure from the government to 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 save these guys so community driven initiatives and uh, well the international collaborations can could uh, do the cultural preservation programs they can uh, they can uh, i mean focus on community driven uh, initiatives towards uh, preserving uh, cultural practices uh, of course uh, education is the key thing uh, it, it it comes with the empowerment and uh, also uh, uh, all these collaboration could create a safe space for uh, community narratives to come out and uh, Uh, most importantly the the promotion of adivasi owned platforms is a must to to get a first and account of uh, of these stories or uh, or this descent so international collaborations exchanges with other indigenous group across the world would help this uh, uh, i mean uh, of course uh, they can these collaborations could help in advocacy for cultural as well as social political rights as well so we do need financial support uh, along with the fair trade practices in this uh, in this uh, whole scenario of art and its dissemination across the world i mean uh, i uh, happen to remember i mean there is a place in jharkhand which is hazari bagh and hazari bagh has a very rich uh, you know there is a, a rock art site uh, where prehistoric painting is there and next to that uh, that uh, prehistoric uh, uh, archaeological site i mean uh, there is uh, a cluster of villages and these villages uh, women in these villages especially they 
they practice a, a tribal art form which is Sohrai and Kohbar, that is wall painting. Uh, they paint their walls in, in, in natural colors uh, the, like red, black from the ash, red from the red mud, yellow from some other thing. And this is uh, the type of painting which, which, uh, which is uh, uh, absolutely similar to the painting depicted in uh, those rock art site. But it is a pity these, these women, they are very much famous. Their artworks, uh, uh, they are simple village, village women. Uh, they do not have any literacy. But their artwork sells in Australia, Germany, Europe, all over Europe. Uh, uh, they have been to these places. But of course, they are not profiting from uh, I mean, the artwork that they do. And also, they, they, they cannot express the story behind their art. And they cannot even express like this is a tradition of uh, women holding the culture throughout generations because this art form uh, of wall painting uh, their mud houses that comes with generations mother teach them daughters and all so so i mean there is a lot to be done and uh, international collaborations and other platforms can uh, of course do help uh, to the every context that the struggles faced by adivasi artists as a as a community. Thanks. Right, sir. And uh, thank you for uh, bringing out a very poignant side of the story, too. Hmm. Okay, so while moving on uh, to the next panelist and the question is, uh, I'll put a question to Dr. Rabin Chakravarti by uh, asking that many of your published works centered around Dalit resistance. So how can the poetics of Dalit resistance be traced in Meena Kandasamy's works? Hello, sir. Right. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just uh, the mute button was uh, being a bit uh, naughty. Uh, as far as uh, Meena Kandasamy is concerned, Meena Kandasamy is a Dalit poet who has been writing in English for more than a decade now. And uh, her poems are particularly militant. And uh, one of the things that we know uh, from Kancha Ilaya is that the condemned must learn to condemn others. And it is that note of condemnation, it is that note of counterattack, which is most prominent in the poetry of Meena Kandasamy. And through her poems, she targets various forms of dominant, orthodox, Hindu mythology, culture, scripture, and various cultural and political icons in order to create a space from where uh, the possibility of the emergence of a Dalit identity as being equal, as being empowered, can become possible. And it is because of this kind of a perspective that whether in an anthology like touch or in an anthology like miss militancy we see that meena kandasamy is regularly rebelling against all those orthodox conventional cultural traditions practices rituals icons which we often take for granted forgetting the kind, the lines of caste-based segregation and the lines of caste-based exclusion and violence that prop up these cultural practices. She's always very quick to point out all of these uh, problems and maladies. And it is by exposing these hidden, generally ignored, often unnoticed, casteist roots of certain cultural practices that she tries to dismantle ideologically the kind of casteist uh, thought envelope in which we are often shrouded. And that same uh, zeal of resistance, that same zeal of condemning others by the condemned themselves is also something which we can notice in different kinds of literary texts being authored by Adivasis themselves. And that sort of creates a kind of a bridge 
between Dalit literature and Adivasi literature as both of them emerge from this point of victimhood towards a zone of self-assertion where their own cultural identities can proudly hold their heads high by defying the kind of vilification and injustice and neglect that have been heaped on them for generations. Thank you, sir, uh, for your insights. And while you're running out of time, I'll, I'll just quickly go on to the last question of the session. That is uh, the last question to be put to Dr. Moshe Bhattacharya. As social media continues to play a pivotal role in shaping public discourse, how do you see Adivasi communities leveraging digital platforms to engage with a broader audience? Uh, since the advent of information and communication technologies, ICT, the approach to interaction and exchanges have undergone significant transformation. We all are experiencing it. And with popularity and acceptance of social media platforms and social networking sites on the rise, people are finding it increasingly convenient to share information, stay in touch with each other, creating awareness about existing issues and challenges, and also to showcase their talent and work profiles. And uh, such a uh, platform, networking sites are opening up financially rewarding opportunities for many people, right? For Adivasis and other uh, tribal groups, such technological offerings are ushering in a new era as youngsters from such marginalized communities uh, residing in remote locations are being able to interact and exchange with others uh, spread across different states of India and also abroad. I hope Dr. Abhin Chakraborty and Dr. Debagbara, of course, they are also experiencing it with, uh, with time. And as such, Adivasis resi residing across Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, West Bengal, Telangana, Jharkhand, and Orissa are being able to discuss diverse issues of common interest, modify and build up narratives, and also collaboratively demand their rights and privileges. Like the way Tell Me Your Story has organized this panel and they are live streaming it through Facebook. I hope many uh, you know, groups, they are trying to you know, connect to this program. So the, obviously this is for such social media platforms, they are getting it. Young Adivasi musicians are finding Pan India, also global listeners for their craft via channels like YouTube. And some are gaining momentum monetarily as well. Facebook groups like I'll, I'd like to mention here a few you know, specific Facebook group, group here, Adivasi Resurgence, Gondwana Foundation, then Adivasi Students Network, uh, Kaitur Gondi in France, Adivasi Yuva Sena, National Indian Tribal Yuva Sakti, and such uh, you know, organizations have been formed over the last few years to act as watchdogs against Adivasi and tribal rights, dilution by governments, and, uh, and also exploitation by other powerful local and you know, national groups. Whenever any such attempt is noticed, information is shared with members of the named groups for information and necessary action. It aids in altering, alerting others and also mobilizes them for demonstration and protest movements. Social media has thus evolved as a cost-effective medium via which Adivasis are overcoming challenges of distance in their effort to instill cohesion and collaboration. And though a start has been made, a long way still needs to be covered. And the affinity of social media usage among youths needs to be transmitted among the senior generations also, which is very important. They will also have to be made aware about the advantages of new age media and how to operate the same. They will also have to be guided about how they can explore financial opportunities through social media, improving their living conditions. If these aspects are not addressed, social media usage may remain limited among the young Adivasis 
and tribals, thereby keeping a notable population outside the periphery. And here I must conclude with this, that with this, digital literacy is something which should be, which should be addressed for the young Adivasis who are using this entire platform. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. In fact, everyone for your well-informed and well-rounded arguments and propositions. So as we draw the curtains of today's session, my sincere appreciation goes out to each of our esteemed panelists for offering invaluable insights on the discussed topic. Before we part ways, a friendly reminder that we are calling for submissions centered around tribal art and tribal representation in art, the details of which can be viewed on www.tellmeastory.biz. We'll come back to you soon with another engaging panel discussion under the project. Until then, I extend my wishes for a pleasant evening to everyone. Thank you once again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.